Imagine that as 2022 started, modern day Russia was suddenly magically taken from this time and space and sent to 22nd of June 1941 just as World War II Germany started Operation Barbarossa, its attack on Soviet Union. Russia then displaces and effectively replaces most of the Soviet Union back then. With the border troops decimated by Germans, suddenly the Red Army finds itself shrunk, but also equipped with decades and decades more modern weapons, and supported by a modern-day Russian industry. Just how would all that affect the Eastern Front in World War II? Oh, and this topic was chosen as the winner of our community poll back in December, so it was mostly produced before February 24th, thus the Russian forces are at the levels they had at the very start of the year. Seeing how a real country might fare in World War II can be tried out in other ways too like by playing Call of War, sponsoring this video. It's a free online strategy game set in World War II, where you choose one of up to 100 real countries and play against other human players in real time. There is really no limit to what can you achieve in game. I love it that I can start with a small country and, if my strategy and diplomacy are on point, I can conquer the whole of Europe, or even the world. Call of War can be played with the same account on both PC and mobile, and the game makers are giving new bink of players a gift. If you use the link in the description below and make a new account, you'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available for 30 days only, so don't wait to fight your way to world domination. Back to our video now. Important to note, the Soviet Union is not the same as Russia. Territory-wise, there is quite a bit of difference. So while the time-traveling Russia mostly replaces 1941 Russia, it does not replace all of the Soviet Union. Those border regions to the west still remain populated with 1941 soldiers that were not part of the Russian Soviet Republic and its 1941 industry, like Eastern Poland, the Baltics, Belarus and Ukraine. To simplify things, this video will ignore the psychological and sociological effects of such an event. The fact that suddenly the whole Kaliningrad region of modern-day Russia would be superimposed over the German-held territory would phase no one. Fighting would just start as if that was normal. Time travelers are to simply continue the fight against Nazi Germany, just like in 1941. As the point of the video is to explore just the modern technology effect, most potent weapons like information will not travel through time. Russia will forget all history after mid-1941, and nuclear weapons will get lost during the time travel event. The leftover troops of the 1941 Soviet Union would be weakened further by the sudden disappearance of the Russian-born part of their army. German troops had run over the Soviets in the real timeline, but this would be even quicker, initially, as the Soviet frontline would be in total disarray without those Russian troops. But just as the 1941 Soviet Union wasn't really prepared for war, the 2022 Russia would not be either. A days would be needed to even fully realize what happened, and for the armed forces to kick into gear. The fact some 150,000 troops are already mobilized around Russia's western borders would help a little, but not much. The troops in Belarus might even first retreat to Russia until the situation is fully assessed. On the other hand, the German war machine was completely ready, and other than losing that small part of troops within the Kaliningrad region, the Germans would still pounce on their neighboring regions right away. When the real timeline Operation Barbarossa started, Germany had more troops on the Eastern Front. It had fewer tanks, but given the doctrinal and technological deficiencies of Soviet tanks, as well as the element of surprise, most of those tanks got obliterated. Both sides had even more troops and tanks farther away, of course, which they poured onto the battlefield in the coming months. Still, it's evident that Germany was very successful in the opening month of the offensive, making the Soviet Union lose almost an order of magnitude more equipment. Tanks-wise, the Soviets were almost brought down to German tank numbers by 1942, and the massive Soviet manpower losses, both due to casualties and surrenders, meant German troops eclipsed Soviet ones by one and a half times by November. Of course, by December, that changed again, as the Soviet mass mobilization machine kicked into gear. So how would those initial months differ in our time-traveling scenario? Initial days would see German troops rushing even quicker through most of the eastern Poland, and through western Ukraine. The Kaliningrad region would be a huge surprise to the Germans, 
As it's also isolated today by NATO countries, the said Russian region is quite protected. It's got roughly four brigades worth of ground troops, a few air defense brigades and air force regiments. But it would find itself faced with hundreds of thousands of enemy troops to the south of it. Germany would advance into Kaliningrad quickly at first, but then meet something completely new to them, advanced tanks, infantry capable of fighting at night, and so on. Still, given the tiny size of Kaliningrad, a fair part of its territory would start getting shelled by artillery. German artillery of the time, though numerous, had much shorter range than today's artillery, usually two to three times shorter. As modern-day Russia has majority of its forces to the west anyway, there wouldn't be a need to send its army half away around the country. Still, with Baltics, Belarus and Ukraine being empty of Russian troops at the start, a week would be needed before the modern-day Russian army makes an appearance. Some tank units would rush in through Soviet Belarus and Baltic's territory to reach Kaliningrad, as well as some of the Russian Airborne Corps units, quickly sent the same way. It's plausible that Russia might eventually send almost the entire Airborne Corps near Kaliningrad. There would be little way for the German Air Force to intercept those planes and helicopters quickly ferrying in troops and supplies. Russia's own air force and air defenses would be a factor there, protecting those incoming troops. Thing is, the German Luftwaffe wasn't actually that numerous. After all the fighting in 1940 and various commitments on the other fronts, Germany did not attack the Soviets with a bazillion planes. Actually, Germany could count on 2600 combat planes for Barbarossa. Back in the real timeline, that force fought a larger Soviet force and won overwhelmingly. And now the Germans would face a force five times smaller than the Soviet one, yet one so technologically superior that there would hardly be any visual contact. Russian planes would detect the German planes from far away and shoot them down with missiles. German pilots wouldn't even know they're in danger until the missile detonated. In 1941, there was no way for Germany to detect an incoming plane or a missile. Sure, there were some ground radars, but those covered only the edges of the front line and would quickly get attacked themselves. And while the German Air Force had bombers and fighters, a lot of Russian planes would be used both as fighters and strike planes. So in actual fighter-capable numbers, the numerical difference wouldn't be that big at all. Here one side would be able to just unleash missiles, kill several fighters at once, then go home to rearm. The Luftwaffe would very, very quickly learn something is not right, when it would start losing dozens of planes per day. Russian SAM units would aid as well. Even if just one-tenth would be in range of German planes at the beginning of the war, the havoc those SAMs could cause would be considerable. We are talking about over 450 ready-to-fire missiles in range, engaging easy targets. As the Air Force can project its power even from its starting bases, Russia would start controlling the skies and do aerial recon within days. Within a week, most of German Air Force would likely be pinned down as most of their airfields would be bombed daily from fairly safe altitudes. On the ground, the situation would be much better for the Germans in the initial days. Russia would still be scrambling to mobilize its active army units in numbers, let alone send them to the front line and mobilization of the overall population would only start to happen. That's a process that can take months to produce combat-worthy units. At Kaliningrad, the Russians would be in a pinch as there's simply not enough depth of territory. They might even temporarily retreat north to present-day Lithuania until they're reinforced enough by airborne units. Still, initially whole Russian brigades might be wiped out, facing an enemy on the initiative right at their doorstep. Parts of the overall front line would still likely move towards Russia, especially in the south, in Ukraine. Russia would likely try to establish a line along the river Dnieper. Defending it would be fairly easy for the military with 50 to 70 years of technological edge in situational awareness, precision and firepower. Today's armed force, even if just 100,000 strong, positioned alongside Dnieper could likely hold off even a 20 times more numerous enemy. At the same time, the overall front line that the Russians will have to be focused on in that case would be cut in half. For any German offensive to succeed, mass vehicle movements would have to happen. While modern Russia does lag behind modern US capabilities in that regard, it would still be able to see those huge lines of German equipment days in advance from the skies. Russian attack helicopters would fire from several miles away from safety. Anti-tank guided missiles would fire from a few miles away both those on vehicles and ones used by individual soldiers. 
Today's T-72 tank variants would easily engage German tanks from a mile away. Back in 1941, German tanks would engage targets only from a few hundred yards on average. The figures given are for 1943, but they're not much better than 1941 numbers. And even if some lucky shot would happen, penetration values for the 50mm gun, the German standard for that time, was under 50mm of steel at a mile away. Most likely, shots to the side of Russian tanks would not do any meaningful damage. And actually, when it comes to overall tank numbers, back then Germany was not really much ahead of Russia today. Given all the reasons we cited earlier, by the time German advance would reach Russia, in a few weeks, German armored vehicles would start getting destroyed by the hundreds each day. That being said, Germany also had significant armament production going on in 1941. In that year alone, Germany produced 12,000 aircraft, most of those being combat ones. Tanks were not as widely produced, but Germany still managed to make 3,600 in 1941. Still, an influx of 300 newly produced tanks within a month would not really challenge the modern Russian force. Tank rounds are extremely plentiful, and even guided anti-tank missiles are likely available in hundreds of thousands. The modern Russian army actually far outpaces the 1941 German army in other armored vehicles, like those for personnel transportation. Basically, most German troops back then did their frontline maneuvers on foot. Russian maneuvers would far outpace them, being done in armored vehicles. Most of the German half-tracks were open on armored vehicles for towing heavy guns. Germany had roughly 3,000 various armored fighting vehicles ready for Barbarossa, on top of tanks. After a month or two of a defensive stance, Russia would likely mobilize a few hundred thousand more troops, and even give them decent equipment, still much more capable than the one from 1941. The numerical superiority that Germany would have on the battlefield initially would quickly start to melt away. Keep in mind that Germany had 3.7 million troops ready for Barbarossa. While of the 350,000 Russian troops, only a part, perhaps half, would actually be near the front line and ready to fight in the initial days. But by July, most of the army would be on the battlefield. By September, many Russian National Guard and reservist units would join in. That National Guard is by today's standards a paramilitary force, not trained for combined arms combat and not comparable to the army in armaments. But in 1941, they would still be better equipped than the average German unit, having armored personnel carriers, mortars and even some artillery. Russia would still be quite limited by the fairly small number of soldiers. They simply could not be everywhere at once, so most of the front would be devoid of Russian offensives. But those few areas where Russians would amass enough forces to go on the attack would see the front line change rapidly. Concentrated armored brigades would be able to demolish nearly anything in their path, up until they run out of supplies. Air Force recon planes would have the German rear area scouted out. Some drone aircraft would circle the battlefield itself, protected by some Air Force planes. Helicopters would aid in further recon. Only serious issue for the Russian Air Force would be ground attack runs. Due to a relative lack of modern targeting and standoff weapons, those would still sometimes be done at somewhat low altitudes, so a better part of the Russian Su-25 fleet, as well as a lot of helicopters, might eventually be lost to ground fire. Most of the Russian tanks and recon vehicles would aid in the effort as well, observed from a dozen kilometers away at times, against a few kilometers at most for Germans, and during the night the Germans would be virtually blind. Indeed, it's likely most decisive pushes would be done precisely at night. During the last 10 or so years, the Russian army has invested a lot in night fighting capabilities, not only for its helicopter fleet or tank fleet, but also for individual soldiers. Most of the maneuver unit soldiers in the Russian army now feature a night vision scope. While still not at the modern US night vision numbers, against the inadequate 1941 technology, even just a hundred thousand modern troops could do a lot. German vehicle formations would be paralyzed, hunted and destroyed. Supply depots and troop concentrations would be under immense and precise artillery barrage, fire corrected by drones. It's likely that the Russians would be making big pincer movements and trapping tens of thousands of German troops at once. Coming back to the air war, the German aircraft production in 1941 was already quite high. Basically every month another 700 planes or more were made. 
most of those could be sent to the Eastern Front Line. Now, actual missile inventory in Russia's air defenses and air force is unknown, but it's likely to be at least eight times the number of launch platforms, very likely more. Flying high for Germans would mean very easy detection for Russian radars and assured destruction. Flying very low would delay detection and could even mean the Germans could have sporadic, very low flying air support, as the Russian Air Force could not patrol the entire front with fighter jets 24 7. Their plane fleet is just not numerous enough for that. But flying low also means loads of tactical short range SAMs, including countless shoulder launched missiles, being fired at German planes. But an even bigger issue for the Germans than losing the planes and tanks would be losing their crews. While some tank crew members would usually survive a neutralized tank, most pilots would die when their plane is struck by a missile larger than a Manpad class one. Planes and tanks are complex machines, they require skills to be used effectively, months or even years of experience, and all those crew members would be dying at an unprecedented rate. In a matter of just a few months, the German war machine, in vain of all the new planes and tanks being produced, would be mostly devoid of actual personnel that has experience running those machines. On top of everything, morale in the German forces would drop significantly, due to massive losses over a short period of time, the enemy that seemingly strikes out of nowhere with precision, and due to an enemy that seems to know where to strike and when to strike even at night. Modern day military capabilities would seem almost godlike to 1941 Germans. On the other hand, the morale of Russian troops would likely be quite high, fighting and winning a war to actually protect their homeland. It's also worth remembering that in the real timeline, 1941 Germany didn't have to face many bomber raids. Yes, the British did some raids, but those didn't amount to much. The Russian bomber force would be able to reach any target in Germany and use nearly countless cheap bombs dropped from a perfectly safe altitude. In 1941, Germany had no means to do effective interception at 35,000 feet. Basically, Russia could increase the tonnage of bombs dropped on Germany by 12 times, compared to the real timeline. And that doesn't include Su-34 raids with laser-guided bombs for precision hits on select industrial targets. Interestingly, if the Russian satellites high above the Earth do not time travel with Russia, there would be no satellite-guided weapons. A lot of the cruise missiles and some bombs would be much less effective planes themselves would have a harder time navigating to their targets. Coordinating army groups on the front would also be harder, not just due to less precise navigation having to be used, but due to much less communication bandwidth available, if there are no communication satellites. Sure, some might be relaunched, but it would be a drop in the bucket. German industry might be faced with a similar level of destruction that it faced in 1944, until Russian bomb stocks dwindle which may take a while. Russia would kickstart production of additional ammunition and armaments, but it's unrealistic to expect those would have an impact as the industry adjusts. Complex stuff like planes, helicopters, tanks and most of the other vehicles would not have time to ramp up production before the war ends. Stuff like dumb munitions, but also simple command or laser guided munitions could however ramp up fairly quickly. The Russian economy would take a massive hit, of course, not due to German activity, but due to the time-traveling event. At the start of 2022, Russian foreign trade amounted to almost half of its GDP. It would actually be worse than what Russia is going through right now. While the war industry would manage, due to the fight for the life of the country, the overall economy would be in shambles. Russia is quite self-sufficient though, in part thanks to various sanctions in place since 2014. Foodstuffs-wise, only fruit would really be lacking. But there are bound to be various items that would be hard to replace in numbers in the short term, impacting a quick switch to high-tech war production. Still, it would be nothing compared to the shortages Germany would be facing. It's likely that by the end of the year Russia would manage to mobilize enough for front-wide offensives. On the other hand, the Germans would be terrified of the almost supernatural enemy, their morale wrecked. If only 20% of the stored Russian vehicles and armaments would get used by the reservists within those few months, it would still constitute quite an addition. With the Russian army properly organized and manned, the front line might already be approaching Germany's borders as 1942 begins. The Ukrainian front line would fall apart as well by then, 
considering that up north even Germany proper would be threatened. Otherwise Germany would face a huge portion of its army cut off, if for example Russia drives south from Poland and towards Hungary, cutting off western Ukraine. Most likely Germany itself would surrender as well. Whether that would take actual entry of Russians in Berlin is debatable. Sure, in the real timeline the German population did not rebel against Hitler. But that was after almost six years of war, during which it was subjected to propaganda, allied bombing and their lives getting gradually harder, with a much more swift defeat of the German army and the quality of life dropping almost overnight, the average person might rebel more easily, including even military commanders, being faced with an almost godlike enemy. Coup d'etat or no coup d'etat, Russians reaching Berlin would be a matter of time. It would surely happen by the early 1942. Both Germany and Russia slash parts of old Soviet Union would ultimately have far fewer casualties due to the war being several years shorter. And actually all this time the scenario was holding back. A direct airstrike on Hitler and the German high command might be attempted. And if somehow one nuclear missile did time travel through, it could be quite useful. Nuking Berlin would most likely result in a beheaded Nazi Germany, one very likely to sue for peace perhaps even in the opening month of the war. In theory, the same could be achieved without nukes, with precision bombing of various locations with the bunker buster conventional bombs. But given that Russia does not carry the knowledge of where Hitler is exactly as the time travels, that might not be such a surefire way to go about it. Without Germany, World War II would end more quickly. In the real timeline, Russia joined the Allies against Japan only in 1945. But ripple effects of futuristic Russia might even cause Japan to rethink widening its war efforts and starting up a war with the US. Even if that still happens, Russia might seize the opportunity to declare war on Japan much earlier and start taking Japanese occupied Manchuria by 1942. Or it might go westward into France. History as we know might be rewritten, so sending modern Russia to World War II might actually create many issues due to the butterfly effect. Which is why all that is not the point of this video. But looking just at the alternate history Eastern Front, technology would triumph over numbers here. 80 years presents too great of a technology gap for a World War II military to fight against. Now a few more words about Call of War. There is various maps to enjoy, the European theater, Pacific one, a US home front or if you really got the stomach for it, the entire world map. Matches are methodical and can last for weeks. Call of War is no clickfast strategy. You get to manage regions and whole countries, direct your economy, trade resources or research over 120 different units. Look at all these, both units and buildings in game are historically accurate models. And yes, you can even nuke your opponents, though I'd say nurturing the right alliance is often worth more. There are regular updates to the game and new free content. Premium content is optional, but Call of War gives new bink of players just that. Use the link in the description below and you'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.